I got blues I got blues in the pockets Got my blues now Got my blues every day Monday comes I got blues in the pockets Now it's Tuesday And the blues come again Knowing that each day comes And I got blues um, To our new members, members, and other chapter members, welcome to the Women's National Book Association, South Florida chapter. We are a national nonprofit networking and educational organization that promotes publishing, reading, and everything to do with books. Our members are publishers, editors, readers, and writers. We hold meetings with a variety of speakers and book-related topics, which are open to the public. Right now, the meetings are, of course, online. Our members also get many networking and educational benefits from publicity and networking opportunities, writing contests, discounts, and the chance to meet a great group of people. If you would like to join or get more information, please check our website, South Florida at WNBA-books.org or find us on Facebook. If you would like to be on the mailing list to find out about future events, you can send an email to the same address you used to register. We'll post the information again at the end of today's event. I'm Benita Goldstein, and feel free to jot down questions for the Q&A session at the end uh, by going to the chat box. And now it is with great pleasure to introduce our two esteemed speakers, Dr. Joan Cartwright and Charlene Farrington. First up is the multi-talented Dr. Joan Cartwright, a renowned veteran of the jazz and blues stage for 40 plus years. She is a vocalist, composer, and author of 14 books, including her memoir. Her titles include Amazing Music Women, So You Want to Be a Singer, and a history of African-American jazz and blues, including interviews with Quincy Jones, Dewey Redman, Lester Bowie, and other noted jazz musicians and aficionados. Ah, I love the color. <laughs> Joan holds a BA in Music and Communication from LaSalle University in Philadelphia, an MA in Communications from FAU in Boca, and she is a Doctor of Business Marketing from North Central University, Arizona. In 2007, Joan founded Women in Jazz South Florida, Inc., a 501c3 nonprofit organization to promote women musicians globally. In 2016, WIJSF released its sixth CD of female composers. Joan hosts an internet, an internet radio show, Music Woman Radio, featuring women who compose and perform their own music. Joan has two personal CDs, Feeling Good and In Pursuit of a Melody. She has performed and lectured around the nation and the world. She is a featured actor in Last Man and the Siblings, two sitcoms produced online by www.mjtvnetwork.info. In 2014, Joan was honored as the first lady jazz master and she was inducted into the South Florida Jazz Hall of Fame by the recently deceased blues diva, Alice Day, in 2018. Please welcome Dr. Joan Cartwright, her program, Blues Women, the First Civil Rights Workers. Take it away, Joan. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Benita, and Andrea, and Linda and Charlene, because she's the one who set all this up. It's her fault. <laughs> so I have a PowerPoint that I'm going to walk you through, because we can't ride through it. 
So I will put it up on the screen. So I have been giving this presentation since 2014 and I just finally put it in the little book that is available at my bookstore on lulu.com. Blues singers in the United States of America emerged from spirituals and blues to develop jazz. So you need to understand the progression. The music started in the fields moved to the church. Then it moved to the, the juke joints, the bars, and the houses of ill repute. That's why it was called devil music. And it moved from blues to jazz. So blues is more or less the mother of jazz, okay? Their free-spirited songs delivered messages of liberation, signaling to Africans in America that they could be free. This music gave them the feeling that they could be free. On the continent, the African voice inspired instrumentalists. Vocalese was a dialogue between vocalists and instrumentalists. Each person had an individual sound and instrumentalists imitated the voices, cries, growls, moans, slurs, whispers, shouts, and wails. Blues was the element of the American subculture created by enslaved Africans singing European music. This is Gertrude Marini, who was really the first well-known blues singer. But there is another one that we will be talking about. <clears throat> blues was considered crude by classical listeners, but it liberated the singers from precise pitch and the calculated rhythms of European music. This presentation discusses how vocalists held the power outside of the realm of instrumentalists and even orators because the music was the accompaniment that provided a foundation for their rhetoric. Now, those of you who understand oratory will understand what that means. From the masked rhetoric of minstrelsy through the unmasked rhetoric of modern blues and jazz, blues women spoke out about racism in America. Blues women provided the means of healing of the human spirit with their musical dalliance that we can be delighted with and grateful for forever. Blues women were the first civil rights workers because their lives and songs symbolized liberty in its rawest form by tapping into the human spirit. The blues women were Mamie Smith, Gertrude Marini, Ida Cox, Alberta Hunter, Bessie Smith, Ethel Waters, Josephine Baker, Billie Holiday, Eartha Kitt, and Nina Simone. I added Miriam Makiba, who came from Johannesburg, South Africa. And you'll understand why as we go along. So in my speech communication class, I teach about voice work. 
the forced silence of women was a subject of concern long before suffrage. The power of voice is a common theme in African-American literature and criticism. Enmeshed in a world of enforced silence, African-American authors saw a voice as a source of personal and political agency. As in most women's fiction and feminist literature, the ability to communicate for African-American writers heralded a search for identity and an affirmation of individual selfhood. Historically, women were constructed as women by silencing their access to public speech with a split in voice. Father tongue speaks in the language of public discourse and social power. Mother tongue, however, is interlocutionary, conversational, and expects an answer. So when you hear women talk, they tend to end their sentences with a question, like they want you to answer their question because they don't have authority. They don't speak from authority. Voice work entails the manner in which an idea is politically and socially said or understood. Vocalists held the power outside of the realm of instrumentalists and orators because the music, the accompaniment was a foundation for their rhetoric. So they had the power of music behind their voice. Blues women stood at the top of the pile of entertainers seen as harmless by the producers and town council that hosted minstrel shows. Relationally, the minstrel mask worked for whites because it symbolized African Americans as happy and fun loving. Rhetorically, however, the minstrel mask worked for Blacks, allowing the minstrels to, to patronize an audience of oppressors while they complained about their low social status without the fear of being arrested and tortured. But this process did not extricate them from the horror of their masked existence. And it functioned as a misused symbol. Cultural politician Houston ba ba Baker said that the minstrel mask symbolized the ritualistic repression of the African's id satisfaction, sexuality, play, castration, anxiety, and humanity. Its mastery constituted a primary mood in Afro-American discursive modernism. The mask was the precursor to African-American literature, politics, and open debate. And the blues women were adept at sporting it. Big Mama Thornton. Blues women were the first civil rights workers because their songs symbolize liberty in its rawest form by tapping into the human spirit. Blues women spoke to and for Black people, providing them an open door to emotional 
escape. So these are the blues women that we talk about. And you can say that they actually began in their 20s. So we're talking about early 1920 to 1984. This is when the blues women were on the scene. So Mamie Smith, we'll talk about her. She was from Ohio. Oops, yes. Blues was performed in the South since the beginning of the 20th century, but none were recorded due to racism and the assumption that African Americans couldn't or wouldn't buy record players or 78 records. Mamie Smith's Crazy Blues changed that, sparking a scramble among record execs to record blues divas. Her Crazy Blues sold 80,000 copies in one month, revolutionizing pop music popular music. The song could be heard coming from open windows of any Black neighborhood in America. According to Danny Barker, a jazz musician from New Orleans, that record turned around the rec recording industry because every family had a phonograph in their house, specifically behind Mamie Smith's first recording of Crazy Blues. Gertrude Moraine, she was from Georgia, and she began singing in during minstrelsy. At the age of four, she traveled with her parents in vaudeville. She was the mother of the blues. She was a spokesperson for black people and a hero to them. She recorded hundreds of songs like Weeping Woman Blues, Broken Soul Blues, and Runaway Blues on Paramount Records, putting that recording company on the map. The most popular blues singers established a rapport and rhetoric with the crowd, winning them over like erudite politicians. Rainey took Bessie Smith under her wing and the blues tradition developed as one followed another. Bessie Smith. She followed in Rainey's footsteps. She became the voice of Blacks migrating to the North and West. In Black Chattanooga, Bessie Smith and the emerging urban South. Michelle Scott outlined Black life in Ninth Street's saloons, the few veiled environments in which Blacks could be truly human a humanity that was powerfully expressed in the blues music that Bessie Smith perfected as a stage performer and recording artist. Poor man's blues called on the rich man to open up his heart and mind and give the poor man that fought World War I a chance. Alberta Hunter. Alberta wrote blues lyrics that empower the singer toward feminist self-affirmation, agency, movement, and change. Her rough childhood was filled with abandonment, abuse, molestation, communal disdain, which gave her self-determination to rise up and avoid trifling men resulting in her feminist lifestyle. Downhearted Blues told anyone who wanted to be with her 
that they had to <laughs> succumb to her command, command, submit to her command. This song put Hunter and Bessie Smith on the road to international fame in the 20s. Throughout her 77 year career, Hunter understood the power that writing wielded for African Americans, but she took precautions because the act, the act of writing was illegal. It was illegal. But it connoted the connection between freedom and the decolonizing of identity. Processes undertaken at tremendous risk because literacy was outlawed and African Americans who wrote endangered their lives with the same strokes they used to claim ownership of their lives. For James Baldwin, the blues artist risked ruin, destruction, madness, and death to find new ways to make us listen. Encouraging the listeners to leave the shoreline and strike all out for deep water. Now I'm going to go back. Having composed well into her 80s, Hunter participated in the blues philosophy that resisting master narratives inspires energies that undermine, bypass, subvert, and exceed patriarchal logic. Ethel Waters. She was a pioneering Broadway film recording and television star on Broadway. And she was the first to do many things. She was the first to be billed above the title in a Broadway show. The first black woman to have a radio show. The first to sing, Am I Blue, Stormy Weather, Heat Wave, and the St. Louis Blues by W.C. Handy. Her biographer, Donald Bogle, recounted the adulation, the money, the critical claim, and how Waters rendered a song to make one feel transported. She was moved to sing Little Black Boy at the funeral of a lynched Black youth thrown on the floor of the lobby of a theater where she was booked in Macon, Georgia. She had to escape out the back door to keep the police from arresting her for singing that song. Her dramatic performances on stage and screen included the Broadway musical As Thousands Cheer and the films Mama's Daughter, Cabin in the Sky, The Member of the Wedding, and Pinky, for which she was nominated for an Oscar. While touring vaudeville as Sweet Mama String Bean, because she was so tall and skinny, Waters encountered continuous life-threatening experiences. She said, I'm not concerned with civil rights, I'm concerned with God-given rights, and they are available to everyone. Josephine Baker. Baker's activism attracted the attention of not only the FBI, but the NAACP that named May 20th, 1951, Baker Day for her civil rights efforts. She had implicit artistic control that spilt over into her radical activism around racism in Europe and the United States, where she came back and toured in 1950. 
She demanded that she perform only for integrated audiences at every venue. If curfew and segregation ordinances were still in place, she requested that they be lifted for the duration of her performance in hope that they would change permanently. Her persona as an agent of change for American Blacks was evidenced by three incidents. She championed Willie McGee, a man accused of convicted and convicted of raping a white woman in Mississippi. She called attention to integration house, integrated housing in Cicero, Illinois. She promoted integrated hiring of bus drivers in Oakland, California. Baker spoke worldwide about the devastation of racism. On August 28, 1963, she was the only female speaker at the March on Washington. Her efforts resulted in the desegregation of nightclubs in northern cities. The reality of Baker's insistence on diversity was her adoption of 12 children from varying nationalities and her insistence upon educating them within their own cultures. Billie Holiday. Billie Holiday first sang Strange Fruit, written by Abel Maripol in 1939. This was the first significant song of the civil rights movement and the first direct musical assault upon racial lynchings in the South. Holiday sang it at Cafe Society in New York revolutionizing the struggle it personified. The song is a testament to the civil rights movement and examines the lives of Holiday and Mirapol, the Jewish school teacher and communist sympathizer who wrote the song that impacted generations of fans, black and white. Holiday's rendition of Strange Fruit was poignant and raw and saturated with pain, evoking another time and place. And yet it's still utterly, it is still utterly relevant to race relations in the United States today. Right now, in this time, Eartha Kid. In June 1967, Kit was appointed to the Citizens Advisory Board on Youth Opportunity by President Lyndon Johnson. She was the child of a raped 14-year-old cotton field worker in South Carolina. She was a student of Catherine Dunham the choreographer, and she de debuted in her first film, Casbah, in 1948 at 16 years old. In 1960, she was blacklisted in the United States for speaking out At a woman doer's luncheon hosted by Lady Bird Johnson, she explained that crime in the streets could be attributed to American youth rebelling because of the Vietnam War. Since 1953, Kit taught dance to poor children. In 1966, she founded the Kitsville Youth Foundation, a nonprofit that served children in the depressed Watts area of Los Angeles. Youngsters in Anacostia, Washington, D.C. asked her to fundraise for Rebels with a Cause. She contacted Congressman 
Congressman Roman Prusinski. And they went before the House General Committee on Education of the Committee on Education and Labor regarding the Juvenile Delinquency Prevention Act of 1967. And they won a grant for the rebels without a cause. In 67, Kit was appointed to this board, but she was not cleared to be on the board because of the remarks she made at the luncheon in 1960. But in 68, she was cleared to attend another luncheon at the White House where the panel of speakers dis discussed crime in America and the Vietnam War. See that? From 60 to 68, it took eight years for her statement to make an impact. Ida Cox. In recent years, the song, Wild Women Don't Have the Blues, penned by Ida Cox in 1924, became a feminist anthem because she wrote and sang openly about sexual freedom, a subject rarely broached by African-American women of her time. So this song was recorded by Sapphire, the uppity blues women. Gay Adeg Balola is the leader of this group. Okay, well actually it's the three of them. I don't think there's a leader. <laughs> but they won many awards for blues. And so you should check her out. She's still living. Gay Adeg Balola and the Uppity Blues Women. They sang about sex, its joys, and its pain, and topical things like school teachers' blues, or nothing's changed, or 1 800 799 7233, the National Domestic Violence hotline number yeah women make songs people make songs about what's going on she said the whole point of the blues is just to get the pain out nina simone nina located american race relations in an international context, in ways that drew attention to gender and race. She was one of the Black women who evoked international and American issues in discussions of race. Simone's fight for gender e equity induced her to use her body, her music, and her words to forge links between Africa and African-Americans and disseminated ideas about black freedom that were not specifically about the United States. In Go Limp, this is a song, Simone played with an older tradition of African-American female singers who sang about sex like second wave feminists who would write about sex. Their protests and politics converged in Simone's music and gender and sexuality informed her denunciation of racial discrimination. Simone said, I started to think about myself as a black person in a country run by white people and a woman in a world run by men. Miriam Makiba. Miriam Makiba was a staunch activist against the South Af African apartheid phenomenon. To the point of exile, she was exiled 
They put her out of South Africa. And here she is with Simone. She joined Nina Simone's protest to American calls for black power when she married Stokely Mark, uh, Carmichael in 1968. Carmichael marched with King. He later took the name Kwame Touré. In conclusion, most blues lyrics referenced unrequited love. They provided a means of articulating pain, suffering, endurance, and overcoming. Blues women were permitted to sing in public forum because they were trusted. That reality announced to African women in America that they had something to say about their treatment at the hands of slave owners, traitors, rapists, and punishing spouses, whether they were white men with whips or black men who betrayed them. The blues are neither mournful nor the cries of victims, but articulate, but articulate a hard-won affirmation of life and self. Baldwin said the blues artist fills the air with life, with her own life, which she understands contains the lives of many other people. Most blues singers are adept at shining light on the darkest scenarios of existence while bringing laughter to center stage as a form of relief for themselves and the entire audience, as well as the accompanying musician. So blues singers just free and everybody. And that's why the Rolling Stones, the Beatles, all of the rock bands listen to the blues singers. Blues women have instituted the primary healing of the human spirit with their musical dalliance that we can forever be delighted with and grateful for. Blues is a breath of fresh air in the stagnant world of discrimination, racism, physical and psychological abuse, and overall inhumanity towards children, women, men, and whole groups of people. Blues permeate the planet wherein people from all nations and all walks of life enjoy the sound of the flatted third as the foundation of lyrics that can light up the face of even the most sardonic human being. So these are some of the songs that were written. Crazy Blues by Mamie Smith, I can't sleep at night. I can't eat a bite because the man I love, he don't treat me right. I mean, it's basic life. So let's see, it's three minutes, but I'm only gonna play the beginning. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay, you can go to YouTube and put all of these in. So I'm gonna play this beginning and I'm gonna take a two second break. So listen and learn. Wild women don't have the blues. 
I used to sing this song all the time. I loved it. <laughs> I hear these women raving about their monkey men, about their traveling husbands and their no good friends. These poor women sit around all day and moan, wondering why their wandering husbands won't come home. <laughs> That's all you get. <laughs> Is anybody still there? <laughs> I love this song. Oh, mother, dear mother, take warning from me. And don't you go marching with the NACP. You know that one, huh? <laughs> For they'll rock you and roll you and shove you in bed. And if they steal your nuclear secrets, you wish you was dead. <laughs> you should really go and listen to this. I don't want to take up the time, but you should go listen to it. It's very interesting. And find the words, because they're very, like this right here, mother, dear mother, no, I'm not afraid, for I'll go on that march, and I'll return a virgin maid with a brick in my handbag and a smile on my face and barbed wire in my underwear to shed off disgrace. Very poignant words, but this one took the cake. about all I have to say. <laughs> because I want to give Charlene time to talk too. <laughs> we have anything in the chat? Ooh. Okay, so that's it. That's all I have to say. Buy the book. Go online. That presentation is a video. And all of those songs are online. I got everything online so thank you thank thank you joan for sharing the important um amazing information on the blues women and um next up um as you are directing is charlene farrington uh charlene farrington manages and oversees expanding and preserving our cultural heritage inc known as EPIC, a nonprofit organization established to preserve and share Black history, the Spady Cultural Heritage Museum, of which she is the executive director since 2012, is located in the West Settlers Historic District of Delray Beach and a project of EPIC. In 2019, Charlene was recognized by the Spady Museum's Board of Directors for her contributions to the Spady Museum the city of Delray Beach, and preservation of Black culture and history. The Spady Cultural Heritage Museum is the only museum of its kind in Palm Beach County, located at 170 Northwest Fifth Avenue in downtown Delray Beach. It is dedicated to showcasing the contributions of members of the African diaspora to Florida and the U.S., 
Programs include exhibitions, city tours, and community events. When you visit the Spady Museum, you can view the current exhibition, learn of coming local events in the neighboring Black communities, and get engaged in a discussion about Black history and its legacy in South Florida. Um, please welcome Charlene Farrington, and I believe we're going to have a, a video put on now. Hello, welcome to the State Cultural Heritage Museum. My name is Charlene Farrington, and I'm the Executive Director. The Spady Cultural Heritage Museum is housed in the former home of Solomon David Spady, who was the third educator for what was then called Colored Children here in Delray Beach. He was born and raised in Cape Charles, Virginia, educated at Hampton Institute, and he traveled to Delray Beach in 1922 to be the teacher here in Delray Beach. He married a local girl. Her name was Jessie Green, and the two of them lived in this house while they were teachers, and Mr. Spady was eventually the principal in the colored school. Mr. Spady retired in 1957, and when he did, he went back to Cape Charles, Virginia, and the school he had taught in all those years was renamed in his honor, S.D. Spady Elementary School. The Spady House, a beautifully restored historic home, features repeating archways, chair rails, and a lovely fireplace. We have converted what used to be the living room and the dining room into a gallery space. Currently showing in our gallery are paintings and photographs from the private collection of Dr. Joan Cartwright. These are uh, pictures of famous jazz artists from the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. These are people who were on the front lines of civil rights work during that time period. Some of these people you will recognize, some of these people may be new to you. But what is very important is that you visit the Spady Museum so you can get a close-up look at some of these famous artists in the United States' history. When you come, staff will give you a personal tour, but you must make sure that you are wearing your mask. We look forward to seeing you on either Thursday, Friday, or Saturday morning from 11 to 1. These are our temporary hours. Thank you very much. I look forward to meeting you in person at the Spady Cultural Heritage Museum. For more information, visit our website, www.spadymuseum.com. I'm so thrilled about this. I have got so many congratulations on this. Welcome this to the epic. I'm your host, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a beautiful exhibition. Um, and I do hope everyone has an opportunity to come to the museum and see it. Show. I did get the time wrong, the, the time frame wrong. Those artists are from the 1920s. What I'd like to do right now is talk just a little bit about the importance of organizations such as the Spady Museum. We are so happy to be able to feature exhibitions like Dr. Cartwright's uh, collection. It really, when you come, you will see, it really feels like this particular gallery was made for this kind of information. We are here as a repository for Black history. Our mission is to collect it, to preserve it, and to share it. And I'm gonna read an excerpt from a paper um, that was presented at the 47th International Scientific Conference on Economic and Social Development in November of 2019. Uh, this group of Croatian scholars who wrote this paper 
from the standpoint of cultural tourism, which is another important role museums play in the success of communities that they serve. So I'm gonna quote from this paper just briefly. Libraries and museums with local collections are sources of knowledge about tradition, uniqueness, and credibility of a nation. They collect, process, and keep materials representing the cultural identity of a community. Through their programs, events, and cooperation with other organizations and heritage institutions, they bring culture closer to all age groups. They interact with the community and provide services that make them proactive and interdisciplinary. Museums keep local history collections as important promoters of cultural heritage that safeguard the identity of local communities and raise the sense of belonging in its members. The development of local collections have a documentational, historical, cultural, artistic, and practical value that makes them and the museums as their keepers important stakeholders in the development of cultural tourism. Ever developing cultural tourism plays a big role in social and economic development, increasing the number of overnight stays and contributions to the state budget. Cultural tourists are more educated and driven by the desire to get to know the local culture and take part in it. The government participates in the development of cultural tourism by providing funding and development strategies. So as, a, as was stated in the paper, not only do museums such as the Spady Museum provide a safe place for the preservation of our community's identity, that identity helps to drive the tourism market that brings much needed money to our state budget. But the most important outcome of these preservation efforts is the education of our people, especially our children. There's no point in hiding our collection. We preserve so that we can share. And in doing so, we empower generations of people to thrive. So it is our pleasure to be able to showcase exhibitions like the current exhibition on display at the Spady Museum in order to empower people, especially young people, with knowledge of self and knowledge of place and to make people feel like they are a part of our community, whether they were born here or they are just visiting for a few days. So thank you very much for allowing me to say those few words about museums and the importance of our museums and our collections in our community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charlene. And um, we can move to questions now. So um, as discussed with both of you, um, I will um, attempt to read the questions. Okay. Uh, let's see what we have here. Okay. Um, here's a question. Um, what happened to Miss Simone? No, that's not a question. That's, that's a, not a question. <laughs> it's, there's a question mark at the end of a, after oh. <laughs> what happened, Miss Simone? What happened, Miss Simone? And what happened to her? If you read her book, his I um I put a spell on you. She was in Europe, and her manager, who I think was her husband too, did not pay her taxes. And when she came back to the cut to the country they immediately took her to jail for tax evasion. She didn't even know, you know. So she, she a couple of things kind of drew, drew, drove her crazy. And if you read that book, you'll know what happened. <laughs> okay, here's, here's a question. Uh, were the early blues singers subject to any type of censorship for some of their sexually explicit and heavy innuendo lyrics? 
Absolutely. Absolutely. The entire Christian community sent to them and called the music demo music. Okay. Because the music was being played in whorehouses and in bars, juke joints. So the, the entire community censored them. Um, there is a comment from Sharon Blake uh, saying she loved this song. Um, and that was uh, right after the Eartha Kit one. Oh, so. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to mention that. Um, I have a question uh, myself, which was, um, what inspired you to write books, Joan? Okay, so I have to go back to the first book that I wrote, which was my memoir, In Pursuit of a Melody. Okay, I have always been in awe of people that wrote books. And I always wanted to write a novel, but I don't have, I can't lie. You have to be able to lie to write a novel. <laughs> I can't. I, because when I get this lie here, by the time I get down here, it's a new, it's, I'm confused. So I decided to write a book about my life when I went to Europe and performed. And it became uh, five books in one. So the green book that I showed you is in there. My song book, my poetry book, and the other lectures. So you want to be a singer. So it's only a hundred pages of memoir, but it took me 13 months to write that. <laughs> it took me 13 months to write a hundred pages. Of course, I hated it for three months and I didn't want to see it ever again. And then I went back and finished it. So it was really my memoir that in motivated me to write a book. Okay, I have another question. Um, Joan, how does the blues music relate to some of the new music that celebrates women's sexuality? How does the acceptance and reaction to it differ or is it similar? I don't think that there's any difference. The only difference is that we have already come through the 60s. Okay, we, once we came through the 60s, everything was good. I mean, we're at a point now where we have pansexuality. Can anybody tell me what that is? No, because we don't know. Our kids know, but we don't know. What's pan? Mm -hmm. What, you have sex in a pan? I don't know. You know, so I don't think there is any really difference in the music itself. I think it's the way... It, it's the audience for it. So the entire, when I say feminist movement, I really mean lesbian movement. Okay, because these women, very few people knew that Alberta Hunter, Bessie Smith were lesbians, you know? But the thing about it is, is many of the women that were in the music industry were lesbians because they hated the men. Sorry, they did. And they wrote about it the way that the men treated them. So, you know, I think it's the audience that is different. I don't think it's the music. Hip hop is reviling as far as women are concerned. And the videos themselves are like, well, I don't want my kids to watch that. So, you know, we, we've been through the sexual revolution, but the things that these women were saying was not so much about sexual freedom 
as relief from abuse. Great, thank you. Um, I think that was it for the questions. Um, although I have to ask uh, Charlene, uh, those trolley bus tours that the Spady was so famous for, do we see them coming back in the future? Well, at this point, they are private tours. So if a group would like to secure their own transportation and come over and pick me up, I'm happy to take them on a tour on their own transportation. But we are not quite yet in a position to provide transportation because as a city uh, function, uh, we are still required to socially distance and we can't figure out how to socially distance on a bus. Not quite yet. So they will come back. Um, but we have to wait until uh, there is some sort of uh, relief from the COVID-19 virus. Thank you so much. Um, if anybody has any other questions, um, right now um, on my screen, I'm not seeing any. No, so, I have a quick question, Benita, to follow up on yours. Is there any possibility for a walking tour with a small group or is yes, the area yeah. Yes, indeed. We do have a walking tour that has been formatted. We simply need to uh, get the uh, promotional material done and distribute it. But we do have a walking tour that is definitely a possibility, and we will be announcing that very shortly. Oh, that's great. And I do want to invite everybody uh, October 20, Saturdays from 11 to 1, October 24th, November 21st, December 12th, which is five days after my birthday, so bring a gift. And how, <laughs> how many days before your birthday? My birthday is December 18th. Okay, so six days before her, five days after me. Bring money. No, I mean, you know. Anyway, <laughs> January 23rd. So those four dates. And if you go to my Facebook page, it'll be up there. Okay. Also, please visit our website, wijsf.org, Women in Jazz, South Florida. Oh, and I forgot, if you come to the Spady, you will get a copy of Mus Music Woman magazine. Mm -hmm. And Dick, Dick, we now have Music Man magazine. You like that? And it's gonna be like this for 2021. It's gonna be like this, and then you flip it, and it's gonna be like that. Oh, <laughs> I'm excited. Thank you so much, Charlene. I love you. <laughs> I love you too, Joan. Yes. So, okay. where's the party? Is it an after party? Cause <laughs> I need a party. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so I guess just to follow up, um, this was really wonderful of the both of you and um, you each have your own very special vibe and yet your two vibes interact beautifully together. Um, so just to conclude, um, the end of the meeting announcement for us um, in our chapter. Um, on November 17th, the program uh, that we're going to be coming up with will feature two authors, uh, best-selling historical fiction titles. We have Kristen Harmel, author of The Book of Names, and Mamta Chaudhry, author of Haunting Paris. If you would like to be on our mailing list to find out about this and future events, you can send an email to the same address you used to register, and that was southflorida at wnba-books.org.
www.ncsa.org. Andy, did I miss anything? Anything you want to add? Um, thank you both very much. Um, I, we, we sent a few messages around with some links that people have been sharing on some relevant um, uh, websites and a Netflix film coming up with Chadwick Boseman and Viola Davis. Um, based on the youngest Wilson play, um, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, which I'm very excited about. Um, so lots more. So check out the Spady Museum and check out Joan's website too. And thank you all very much for coming. Thank you so much. I thank really you. appreciate it. And I do look forward to the recording. Okay. Thanks, Dick. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Linda. Good night. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you very much. Hi, Lisa. Great. Hi, Sharon. <laughs> Hi. That's my that's my student, Elin. Oh wow. Gwen is here, love. my assistant. I love you. Down. I love you all. <laughs> Wait, I gotta take a oh, good your shot. presentation. Wait, wait, don't go anywhere. I have to take a picture. Oh, okay. Okay, so ready? Everybody <laughs> smile. Good, good, I got it. You make a smile, Joan. Oh, that's nice. But it's the blues women. So you have to go to YouTube. Put in Treat Me Right by Joan Cartwright. Treat yeah, Me Right. right. You are risque. Oh, this is, it's very risque. All right, go on there next. <laughs> Linda's taking a picture. Oh, where did he go? Uh, Dick, did you want to add anything? You're unmuted now, too. So I know that you and Joan spoke together at the Arts Garage. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, this so this was enjoy. great. I, I can't wait to go to the Spading Museum. I'm yeah. really excited. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I think we need one of those walking tours. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Or you can do your own. I mean, that's how I discovered the whole history of the area because I like to walk around and I'm usually not ever afraid to walk around anywhere. I just like to explore and there's wonderful plaques that talk about the history mm -hmm. in uh, the area around the Spady Museum. Um, but, but it didn't talk about the museum, so I didn't learn about it until now. Oh my. Great place. Okay. Hey. Uh, we may have missed it. Uh, until what date it is uh, Joan. Joan's exhibit going to be at the Spady? Oh. oh, the exhibit will be open through the end of February. Oh, so great. it's a nice long run. Very, wow! Yeah. It's a nice long run, yes. Okay. Yes, absolutely. I'll see you there for sure. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Great. Anything else? Okay. I'll probably see you too, too there, Natalie and Dick. Okay, great. Thank you again, everybody, for coming. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank Good night. You. Love you. I got blue feelings. I got blues in the pockets. Got my blues now. Got my blues every day. Knowing that. Now it's Tuesday.